think of the sun's heat on your upturned face on a cloudless summer's day. From 150 million kilometers away, we recognize its power. The sun is the nearest star, a glowing sphere of gas. The surface we see in ordinary visible light is at 6,000 degrees centigrade. But in its hidden interior, in the nuclear furnace where sunlight is ultimately generated, its temperature is 20 million degrees. Atoms are made in the insides of stars. Our planet, our society, and we ourselves are built of star stuff. We're in a cave carved through the earth by a river of molten rock. We've brought a Geiger counter and a piece of uranium ore. If we bring it close to the uranium ore, the count rate, the number of clicks, increases dramatically. If I drop the uranium ore in a lead canister here, which absorbs the radiation, and cover it up, the count rate goes down substantially, but it doesn't go down to zero. What's the source of the remaining counts? Well, some of them come from radioactivity in the walls of the cave. But there's more to it than that. Some of the counts we're hearing right now are due to high energy charged particles which are penetrating the roof of the cave. We are listening to cosmic rays. When's the last time you watched Cosmos with Carl Sagan? Recently, actually. Really? Yeah, I, I showed it to my kids a couple of years ago. Uh, Empire Strikes Back and Cosmos were probably two of my formative influences at the age of six. I don't even know what that is. It was a mini-series on public television that came out in 1980. It's hosted by Carl Sagan, and it was extremely broad in its scope. He popularized not only science, but a love for science and a perspective on science and society that I thought was just magnificent. I can appreciate so much more now as an adult going back and watching it. 2,000 years ago. In Alexandria, there was an immense library and an associated research institute. And in them worked the finest minds in the ancient world. The organizers of the library combed all the cultures and languages of the world for books. They sent agents abroad to buy up libraries, Commercial ships docking in Alexandria Harbor were searched by the police, not for contraband, but for books. The scrolls were borrowed, copied, and returned to their owners. Huron of Alexandria invented steam engines and gear trains. He was the author of the first book on robots. Eratosthenes accurately calculated the size of the Earth. He mapped it. Hipparchus first cataloged the positions and magnitudes of the stars. Euclid produced a textbook on geometry which human beings learned from for 23 centuries. Galen wrote basic works on healing and anatomy which dominated medicine until the Renaissance. These are just a few examples. There were dozens of great scholars here and hundreds of fundamental discoveries. The glory you see around me is nothing but a memory. It does not exist. It's as if an entire civilization had undergone self-inflicted radical brain surgery so that most of its memories, discoveries, ideas, and passions were irrevocably wiped out. Here were clearly the seeds of our modern world. But why didn't they take root and flourish. Why instead did the West slumber through a thousand years of darkness? Science never captured the imagination of the multitude. There was no counterbalance to stagnation, to pessimism, to the most abject surrender to mysticism. So when, at long last, the mob came to burn the place down, there was nobody to stop them. Imagine how different our world would be if those discoveries had been explained and used for the benefit of everyone. What if the scientific tradition of the ancient Ionian Greeks had prospered and flourished? I think we might have saved 10 or 20 centuries. Contributions that Leonardo made would have been made 
a thousand years earlier and the contributions of Einstein 500 years ago. We might by now, I think, have the first survey ships returning with astonishing results from Alpha Centauri and Sirius and Tau Ceti. The inscriptions, if we look closely, would be written in Greek, Starship Theodorus of the planet Earth. We like to think of our march forward into progress as a march forward in a linear thing, but I, I think what he was saying is that's not necessarily true. Human beings have been superstitious and fearful for most of their history, and an era of enlightenment has been a relatively uh, short space of human history, and by no means assured that it will continue in that manner. I am worried that without access to affordable and sustainable energy, we will literally not only revert to barbarism, but revert to social institutions like slavery. And I mean that with all seriousness. The basic reason we're interested in nuclear power as an energy source is because it represents an energy density far in excess of chemical energy. E stands for energy, M for mass, and C squared is the speed of light multiplied by itself. Now, C squared is a very great number. And so, if multiplied by even a small mass, the result will be a very great amount of energy. Nuclear fission is a million times more energy dense than a chemical reaction. Now, you know, civilization has changed over advancements in technology a whole lot more modest than this. And this is also significant because there's really no in-between between chemical energy and nuclear energy. There's no atomic structure other than the electrons in the nucleus. It really is a change from going from chemical energies to nuclear energies, and it's a huge step. 